His name was Christian Buner. He um, he contacted me. Uh, he and his uh, friend had a recording studio in the Canary Islands of Spain, and he uh, contacted me and um, sent me his uh, CD. So that's actually from a CD by Christian Buner called One Mind. Okay, I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he sent me the same version of the song in German. So that's quite um, quite interesting, because I, I don't know German. You know, I have a last name Hofmeister. But uh, I was listening to the German version of that song, and Let It Go in German, you know, that part was The Assist. And I thought, how interesting. That's the only way that you can let it go, is with The Assist. <laughs> you you need the the assist of the Holy Spirit's, you know, taking it. You can offer it to the Holy Spirit, but you need the assist to, to have it taken away. So that was beautiful. Again, these are our practical sessions, following up on some of the topics of uh, the morning, and uh, yeah, it's great. Those expression sessions really get you going. <laughs> and then, then when we come in here, it's like. Here we go, just keep carrying it through. So again, I open it up and the uh, microphone is on, is on its way. Rick has got it. I'm realizing um, how much I still really want to hang on to my children. And that aren't really children, I guess. been seeing in the expression sessions that I've got Cody and I've got Paulie there that remind me of my boys and I, I have this feeling like I've only just started to fall in love with them and it's like I had children to um to give me something when I got old and that they would be there for me. And so for the longest time I just thought they were really just these objects that were in my life to do as they were told and eventually I'd get a payoff and when I was old they, well, they would look after me. And something happened and it was like I could really see the benefit of them being in my life, where my life turned from the attention of just of myself to <laughs> include them somehow, that they, they were my learning. And it just feels like the more I've given myself to this, the more I've even found that I can just love them so much. But I really got to see in the group this morning that I want to be special and that I want to be their mum and I don't want someone else to be their everything. So I guess I really need help with that because I really feel that love real and that I don't want to give that up and um, and I really don't feel anything else will give me um, that joy and that happiness that I feel like I get from that. So in that way, they feel like my everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the spiritual journey, it, underneath the surface of things, there's this deeply rooted belief in, in loss. And it plays out in a number of different ways on the surface of consciousness. 
Um, we talked about, the other night we were talking about the ego's rage and anger at wanting the fantasy world to be true and like holding out and raging at, at God, uh, hoping that God will finally cave in and give reality to fantasies. And it's pretty late in the text, and so you know it's quite, it's getting quite to a, a sense of you have to really evolve to it, but when you get towards the end of the text of A Course in Miracles, he begins talking about self-concept versus self. And basically what we are learning is, is that, that everyone who comes to this world makes a concept of the self and a concept of love and really pursues it very strongly in many different ways. Some people it's, it involves children, some people it involves animals and pets, sometimes it involves partners. Um, sometimes people will even do that with their vocation or their work. You know, it will become a centerpiece and be the centerpiece of their identity in this world. And the Holy Spirit's job is to exchange self-concepts. So, in other words, it would be too traumatic and the mind would never go for it to, to exchange the self-concept for the capital self or for divine love. And so, it's a process of exchanging self-concepts. And the only way that the process proceeds is we have to have more expansive self-concepts that the Holy Spirit gives to us to slip into. And then we slip into another one, and we slip into another one. And each time there's a shifting or an exchange of self-concepts, there's an expansiveness. There's a deeper sense of freedom, a deeper sense of, of love. And that's the question, who would exchange a self-concept or who would exchange something that they felt brought them lots of love for something else unless they had an experience of that something else. So we're not asked to kind of try to imagine what that might be or we're not asked to actually uh, just have faith uh, that, that there's something better waiting for us. We, we have to practice, we have to allow the miracle to come, and we have to allow the Holy Spirit to do the Holy Spirit's task, which is this exchange of self-concepts. Uh, when I first started with the Course, uh, in 1986, I just studied it pretty much on my own, and then around 1989 and 1990, I, I started to have these people showing up that were very drawn to going deeper with me into the Course. And that phase of my life, you could have titled it, <clears throat> Married with Children. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was kind of having in mind the people that would show up, the students, and my friend Mary showed up and she was married with children. And my friend Rhonda showed up and she was married with children. And I said, how fascinating. <laughs> Here I am open to just going much deeper and what's showing up is married with children, married with children. And um, I remember going on a road trip one time uh, with Rhonda and uh, she had all of the same feelings that you were just expressing. Just even going on a road trip. Off we went in Michigan on this road trip. And I said, well, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised because it's like your children are really with us on this road trip. And uh, since it's such a powerful symbol in your life, your children are going to show up and the, you were just mentioning with with Cody and Polly, that's exactly what happened. We went on a road trip and there were children, children, children. They just weren't her biological children, but she had wonderful, wonderful encounters with them. And, and it was the beginning of, of lessons in form and content. Like, like, whatever we perceive in this world, whatever we perceive the form to be, uh, the content is the love, and the form is is what seems to bring the content to us. 
uh, and we can get very attached to the specific forms and think that it defines us and yet when we open up to the spirit we can have the same kind of experiences and connections but the forms shift almost like the spirit is slowly, slowly starting to say, the form isn't so important here. The spirit doesn't come right out at the beginning and say, the form is irrelevant. <laughs> but it's more like, little by little, we have experiences of reflections of this deep love that starts showing up. Uh, sometimes it's with animals. Um, the same things has happened, I know, for, for myself and my travels. Uh, Helena, your, your dogs, the spirit found good homes for your two whippets, and then there were dogs and dogs and dogs along the way. I've always loved animals, and when I would travel around to all these places, oh, I would when the door would open, I was greeted so many times with, with animals, lots and lots and lots of animal symbols. Um, Kirsten grew up in New Zealand and was used to beaches and lakes and bodies of water and when we traveled around the country and the world uh, it was water 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 everywhere it was just like symbols of water <laughs> lakes and rivers and oceans it was just like those particular travels with Kirsten were just filled with water symbols uh, also Kirsten has a, had a great affinity for ice cream so it didn't matter what continent we went on, we went to South America, helados, 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 helados. It was like ice cream, ice cream, ice cream everywhere. Some of you know that story too, when, when she was in a real funky mood. One time when we were in Wisconsin, she was just so caught up in ego one morning and we were out walking along this riverbank. And uh, so I kind of prayed to the Holy Spirit, how can I be most helpful, and the Holy Spirit said, take Kirsten to Dairy Queen. <laughs> uh, see how different it is from counseling, a course, course of Miracles, workbook lesson, whatever, Dairy Queen. And I turned around and I saw the, you know, the red roof, there was the Dairy Queen, right there. And so I tell the parable how we, I said, come on, and I took her hand, and she was in a real funky movie, went in there. We, were, we walked in, we were the only two in the Dairy Queen, and the guy with the little Dairy Queen hat saw us coming, his chest po puffed up, and he was all happy to see us, <laughs> customers. And I went up there, and I walked up, and I kind of reached across the counter, and I put my arm on his shoulder, I said, she's from New Zealand, and she's never been in a Dairy Queen ever before in his, her life. She, he was like, <gasps> <laughs> it was almost like he had been given his d divine task. He was really puffed up. I said, so show her what you got. He said, wow! <laughs> and he was telling her about the cones and dipping cones and blizzards and oh my gosh. It was just like hundreds of, of options and her eyes were real big and I don't know what he finally ended up serving her, but that ego funk passed in a hurry. <laughs> it just completely, the ego can't, can't stop the spirit's use of the symbols. It was just the light use of symbols. So, when you get into living this and having that experience, the way that you are led into a more expansive state of mind is through the spirit using the symbols. And with children, there are a lot of beliefs, like you're able to identify you know, reasons for having the children, and so on and so forth. And even when some of those start to wash away, you say, oh, now I'm letting go of those, but I'm just feeling this deep love for them, and, and I still want them to be a part of my life, and I want to be a part of their life. And what it is, is, is the essence of who they are is, the essence of who you are, and and that essence just wants to shine, and shine, and shine. And a passage that helped me was Khalil Gibran, you know, in, the, in his little book, The Prophet, you know, your children are not your children, they are the sons and daughters of life's 
longing for itself. They come through you, but they are not of you. And it's such a beautiful kind of reorientation of children, you know. It's just the poetic, you know, just like with Rumi and Khalil Gibran, it's just so, it's like this Middle Eastern Lebanese poetry just flowing, flowing, regarding the deepest topics and deepest subjects we could think about. So, um, this happened too when I traveled with Donna Marie Carey uh, in 1992. Um, she so much wanted to go with me and sing her heart out and shine her light. And her biggest problem was, was she had a daughter, Rachel. And um, I think Rachel, here we are, we're down there in Owensboro, Kentucky. She's feeling this huge call, like the Holy Spirit's calling her to this huge function, and she's thinking, oh, Rachel was maybe 12, 13 years old. It's right at the beginning of teenage years. And she had to say, David, I'm going to have to pray on this. She prayed all day. She took a walk around the block. Finally came back and said, okay, I'm going to go. But over the years that I knew her, in those early 1990s, and, and worked with Donna Marie, um, it came more out that she had had two older children that were like, around 19, 20, 21, that she had left, and she had felt like she had left her children, and she was swearing she wasn't going to make the same mistake with her th 12, 13 year old Rachel. And yet the call was so strong, and there were some trips, there was a trip where uh, I said, well, oh, I think Rachel's supposed to go along with us, and she, we visited her older children, and we, Holy Spirit, use all of those symbols as part of the healing. That she was being called to this glorious function, but we had beautiful uh, interactions with Rachel coming along with us. A lot of beautiful lessons with, on the road with Rachel. One time, too, uh, she came up to Cincinnati with Rachel, and Rachel brought a girlfriend along. And we were going to be going up to Michigan, so it was Donna Marie, me, Rachel, and Rachel's friend. And we got in the car, and we started driving up Ohio, and driving up on the highway, and the little girl that Rachel had invited just seemed to go to, to this sickness where we'd be driving along, and she would just barf <laughs> in the back seat all over Rachel. <laughs> uh, and Donna was in the front seat, just like looking back, going, Terrible, what a terrible idea. And then we would get off, we would go to the service station or the gas station, and we would clean the girls off and get them all cleaned up and rinse them and everything, go back, and we would drive and we'd probably get another 45 minutes or an hour, and then blah, this would just, <laughs> we'd just fly all over back. And then we'd go, we stop off to the gas station, clean the little girls off, get them back. And this happened. This was like a five-hour drive, um, and so just periodically, you had every 45 minutes to an hour. It just happened over and over and over. Finally, we got up into Michigan. We stopped at a campground, and it was over for the for the girls. You know, you know how children are. It's almost like when it's happening, it's horrible, but when it's over, it's like it. It's as if it never happened, and I'm kind of in that. It's it's never happening state of mind anyway. So. I, I was like with the girls, it's like, let's go swimming, and yeah, and we'd get out of our bedding suits, and Donna was just, oh, migraine headache, just like, because she was taking it on, the mom concept, this was a bad idea, and taking it on, the kids had let it go completely, we were just splashing in the water, and playing and playing, she was dealing with a migraine headache, and, and those were a lot of the what happened, where the children were included in the mind training lessons, but still the responsibility, the control, the I know mind that was part of the mothering was causing a lot of pain. You know, with her in the car with the two girls and me, she was like in, in the car with three children. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's tough to hold on to those concepts you know, in the face of this spontaneity and this joy that just is, wants to shine and be free and express. And um, 
And it's been that way too, in the sense that um, one time I was traveling with Donna Marie Carey, and it wasn't, she had a lot of stuff coming up about her children a lot of times, but one time she had this man in her mind, <laughs> and she was going through so many gyrations with this man in her mind, and finally uh, we stopped, I think at a campground, or we stopped to stay with some people, and she just, the song just poured out of her, and I'll play the song, uh, because I think it is very applicable to you right now, just like the song was for, for Francis, Let It Go. Um, she was having such an intensity with this man in her mind, and so much struggle that she just prayed to the Holy Spirit, and, and this song came through, and, and you could sing it, you could sing it to your boys, uh, because some of the lyrics are, you know, my idea of what you are cannot compare to what you really are. You're much more than anything I can see. I can't lock your image in time, try to change you or make you mine. I'll give you to love what you were meant to be. And now the greatest gift I can give is to give you back to love, back to what you were meant to be. When I give you to love, I give love to me. And it's a very powerful song, and it freed her from this torment with this man in her mind. But it works with children, it works with pets, <laughs> it works with houses, <laughs> it works with anything. It's like the Holy Spirit is like, oh my beloved child, if you only knew all the love that waits for you in awareness, you know, you would spring, you would leap back into it. But on the way, whatever seems to be in your life, that seems to be love, but also seems to be a, a source of pain, please, please give it to me. I uh, like that Diana Ross song, you know, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. So if you ever need the need for company, feel the need for company, please, my darling, let it be me, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is saying. You know, I, I will never let you down. So, I think I've got that right here. Thank you. 
washing process of just being washed, washed of these self-concepts. And then as we let these self-concepts be washed, we have more and more expansive experiences. And those are leading us higher and higher in consciousness and awareness. And we need those expansive experiences. Without them, who would exchange the status quo for the unknown? You know, we, we have to realize that, that as we're waking up, spirit, God, love is the unknown, and the human condition is the familiar. And people have asked me all the time when I travel, they said, why would I give up something that is familiar for something that's unknown? And I say, I have to agree with you. <laughs> I don't think that's a very good trade. It seems a bit risky. <laughs> the known for the unknown, the, the familiar traded in for the big question mark. But, but the more you study the metaphysics of the Course, you realize that that we've had a case of amnesia going on, where we've for completely forgotten God, and we've turned the only thing that's knowable <laughs> into the unknown, and all that which we could never know into the known. We've completely flipped the switch <laughs> on God, and God is the big question mark, and Baseball, hot dog, ah. apple pies, and Chevrolet. Those illusions <laughs> that we be have become familiar to us, you know, are the known. And we just really have to be willing to be carried, to be lifted up beyond the known into this state of mind. Which, as you're going through the awakening, that state of mind is just a promise, you know. Uh, when you read the Bible, when you read the Course, you say, wow, there's a lots of promises in here. <laughs> and, you know, will they come true is the, is the big question, you know. Do I, do I continue to even open and strive and, and attempt to move in that direction? Or should I just join Atheist Anonymous and, uh, you know, and make the best of it? <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry, because for one day I shall die, you know, and pop into uh, Atheist Anonymous. You know, you really, those tend to be choices as we move along, and when there's still a, a lot of doubt and resistance to what seems to be the unknown, you know, oftentimes on a daily basis, those are the kind of confrontations, questions that come up in mind. And it's only through miracles, it's only through the experience of miracles, that we are shown that our faith is not blind faith. That faith is rewarded through experience. When you start to experience peace, when you start to experience freedom, experience joy, experience happiness, well, then the tables have turned <laughs> toward God. And even if you don't know the fullness of that experience of God, you certainly know that you're in the tractor beam uh, with those experiences. And that's what carries you and lifts you up. It's experiences. If this is a world of belief, how do you go beyond belief in a world of belief? You need experiences that point beyond the belief, that, that take you more and more to higher states of mind towards forgiveness. And forgiveness, in the end, is an experience uh, as well. It's an experience that will take us there and beyond it to all the way back to God. So, I have the opposite problem of Karen. <laughs> I have a mother who has really put, like, a lot of um, protection on me. Like, she's so fearful. She literally didn't even want me to grow up, and it caused me a lot of concern and difficulties, but I've gotten to the point where I've used it as a huge forgiveness lesson, because what I thought was her fear was really the depth of my fear coming up, and my anger that um, took, you know, over a decade to clean, clean up or clear up. So I have nothing but gratitude.
gratitude to my mother. We're in a situation now, though, where there's still that emphasis of, I'm supposed to take care of her, <laughs> or she needs me, and yet I haven't even been around for, um, since 1990. Um, you know, there have been uh, sporadic visits and, you know, phone calls, but I'm still get feeling the pressure of, of that, that it's my responsibility that I should be there. And um, I keep resisting that. Um, and yet I'm still very respectful of her. And, I, and I, I don't talk about any of this that I talk to you. I mean, literally, it's like um, when, you know, she thinks this is a cult and everything. And it was just like this whole fear factor of it. And so I have to be very careful and use spirit to kind of guide it through. And a lot of times it's just a lot of quietness and, and um, just leave it at that. So, like, this is still my lesson. This is one of those, the third relationship where you have a lifelong yeah. lesson. <laughs> That's her, <laughs> her and me. But how can I, like, I've been cleaning and clearing and cleaning and clearing for, you know, 20 years. Is there more that I can do? Is there, like, to shift that witness, you know? Because I still play into it. When I'm, if I'm there physically, I get totally wonked. And if I come back to BC, like she's in Ontario, if I come back to BC, it would take me about a month to kind of get myself together again. Um, is there anything that you can say about that on the other spectrum? Yeah, I think when we go into that, what, the way you're describing it too is, is when we go down into responsibilities, duties, obligations, um, we can see that the ego set this world up with lots and lots and lots of what I'll call pseudo-responsibilities, pseudo-obligations, pseudo-duties. Uh, almost like uh, they're like tethers to the world, to the thinking of the world. Kind of like those old parades, I don't know, in the United States we have like Thanksgiving Day parades and so on and so forth, where they get these big giant helium balloons and then they got to have all these people with these like cords <laughs> like steel cords all walking beneath this giant Snoopy dog or <laughs> this giant whatever the, the whole parade you know you see one giant balloon coming after the next and the balloons have helium in and the only way that it works is you got to have a crew uh, tethering that to earth and the ego made up the bodies, it made up the roles, it made up the responsibilities, and we'll just use the uh, mother-daughter, uh, just like we were just talking with Karen with mother-son, we'll use the mother-daughter as an example of that. So the ego made up this false construct to take the place of God, and there's enormous fear and guilt and shame and pain with this construct because it's a God substitute. And it's on the surface of things, it's, it's seen as, as a very good and important uh, relationship. And these roles are not to be taken lightly at all. A violation of these roles is, a, is like a, what the world would say, oh, that, you're bad. You're bad. So like there's the role of the mother or the role of the daughter, in your case. And if daughters don't do the obligatory things that good daughters should do, then you're bad. You're wrong. You're terrible. You're not worthy of anything. And so we'll say the role of mother or the role of daughter are, I'll use the word, ego ideals. The, the thing that makes them so sticky is the ego makes them up as ego ideals and then when you try to be a good fill in the blank, a good daughter, a good mother, a good citizen or whatever, you never can achieve it. They're, they're absolutely unachievable. <laughs> and that's exactly why the ego invented them. <laughs> because you can never be good enough, a good enough son, a good enough daughter, a good enough mother, a good enough father, a good enough citizen. You can't even be a good enough Course in Miracles student. Uh, 
Yeah, and believe me, once you get into anything, the ego will, will make an ideal out of it, and then it will hold it up, going, oops, look, you, you missed the mark again. <laughs> Not even close. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty again. Condemned, as usual. And you have to begin to understand the metaphysics of how this works, because on the surface, you could draw forth witnesses around you, maybe in Vancouver Island, Ontario, like, well, well, she's your mother. <laughs> you know, she's your mother, you've got to da 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 da. So, you go deeper with the Course, you start to understand the trick of the world and all the tricks of the ego, and then it's not like you shouldn't be responsible, because the Course is not calling you to irresponsibility, the Course is calling you to the highest responsibility that there is. And I would say more than the highest, the only one. <laughs> Jesus is, makes it really easy. He's saying you don't have multiple responsibilities, complex multiple responsibilities, because they're going to conflict. They always do. But you have one responsibility. The sole responsibility is to accept the atonement for yourself. Accept the correction for the ego. And all this mind training is aimed at only one thing, accepting the atonement for oneself. That's it. Point blank. Very simple. And he even throws in other passages about responsibility. I am responsible for what I see. What he's meaning there is, I am responsible for what I perceive. It's not being thrust upon me, these perceptions. I am responsible for what I perceive. I choose the feelings I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Whew. Air tight. <laughs> Try to hold a grievance with that on your mind, <laughs> you know. But 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 you go back to God. But 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 ah. <laughs> when I was traveling with Beverly in the on my second road trip down to Florida, and we were driving along, and she had a Toyota Corolla, and we were talking, and she's talking about everything and this and this, and she was using the my word a lot, my car. I said, well, at one point, I said, well, you know. It's actually not really your car. I mean, your your name's on the, the title and everything, but it's actually, it's really just some another symbol and image that the Holy Spirit can use. It's really not your car. We pulled into Miami. We we went out for a walk on the beach. We came back. The car was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and she just, we stood in the yellow lines in the park. We each were standing on a yellow line looking at where the car was. It, it had our tent, our wallets, our clothes, our music, everything. Our Course in Miracle books, everything. And the Toyota Corolla, a little kind of light blue, silverish light blue, was gone. And I remember I looked at her, because she just looked at me with this blank look, kind of like, now what? Kind of thing. And and uh, what, I told her a few things, you know, one was, all things work together for good, there are no exceptions in the Holy Spirit's, except in the ego's judgment. Um, everything that seems to happen to me, you know, I ask for and receive as I have asked, and uh, uh, nothing you need will be denied you. Those are the three ideas that came. Really good ideas, when you're looking at an empty parking space. <laughs> Holy Spirit zooms in there real quick. So I said, can you trust? And she's like, yes. So then we were picked up by park rangers, and it turned into a miraculous parable. That uh, eventually the, the car came, came back, uh, and it had all kinds of miracles in it, and we went up the other coast of Florida telling the miracle story, the parable, to unity churches, course groups, or whatever. It was all just used beautifully to, to demonstrate trust. Uh, that if you trust, you, you will be provided for when you're doing God's purpose. So, so ultimately, that's the way out. You, this, you're on to it, Lucia, is that, that you can see that in terms of salvation, atonement, lasting peace of mind, that this is something that will have to be washed. And ultimately what it is, is, is basically you're just saying, okay Holy Spirit, you're going to have to convince me 
that really I do have one responsibility. All my past learning and conditioning is telling me that that's not true. And that if I let go of these other ones, and it's not so much letting go of, it's just like chop it off, but it's more, we always have to give it to the Holy Spirit to unwind us from what the ego set up. We can't just abdicate and say, ah, oh, I listened to David today, <laughs> he told me I only have one responsibility, so chop, chop, get the axe out, wham, bam, <laughs> I'm going to just chop off these other ones. It's actually we have to be unwound out of what the ego made. And that's why I teach people don't really abdicate on things that have been set up even if uh, they're ego ideals, you have to be unwound from them by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has to guide and direct the way. But that is exactly what is happening. In, in one sense, what it takes is it takes the willingness to, you know, give them back to love. You know, give these roles and concepts back to the Holy Spirit. Um, I know, I was down in Australia several years ago, and uh, my friend Raj was hosting me, and his partner Suzanne came to me, and I was just there one night, she came to me, she was crying, and she just poured her heart out, and it wasn't, it was, her, her father was part of it, but it was really her son um, was, he had been involved in drugs and drinking for so many years, and he got the equivalent down there in Australia of what we would call over here as a DUI, you know, driving under the influence of alcohol. And basically, uh, she'd been on the phone with him, and he was to go before the judge the next day, and she was just, I don't know what to say to him, I feel so bad. This time they could throw away the books, they could lock him into jail for a lot of years, because this was a lot of occurrences with drinking under the influence down there. She was very, very frightened. I think he was probably like in his early 30s, and so it's not like that when you talk about children, they have to be babies or young children. I've seen this happen with a friend of mine when I was going through uh, Iowa, and I, she was talking to me about all of her anxiety about her son and her fears and concerns, and she was in her 90s, and this son was like in his 70s. I mean, it was just like, I was like, oh my God, the ego, this, these ego ideals, the ego will not give up. Still guilty about the son, and the son's in the 70s, and it's like, oh, for Christ's sake. You know, it's like, but for her, it was really a serious matter, you know, she was really all shook up about this seven-year-old guy that was not doing what he, she thought he should be doing. Her baby, <laughs> seventy-year-old baby. But this, getting back to the Australia parable, uh, actually, what happened was she just said, I, "I am, I am sick about this, and I don't know what to do." And I said, "Well, you know what's going on here is you still believe you can care for him better than the Holy Spirit." And you have not recognized the arrogance of thinking that you can care for him better than the Holy Spirit. What you haven't done is you haven't released him to the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean just say the words, I release you Holy, to the Holy Spirit, but you really feel responsible for him. And it's the same with the mother. As long as you still feel responsible, then you will take on all this other stuff, all this other baggage, all this other conditioning. You're still clinging to the self-concept and thinking that you can care for him better than God can. So she really did. She took it. She had tears. She took it to heart. She went, she said, I just went, I'm going off and I'm going to release my son. And she did. And after she did, it was amazing. She could call him up and, and really say, I love you, really say, it's all going to work out for the best, really say, I'm in it with you all the way, and she had no fear and hesitation. The power and the glory and the might of the Holy Spirit 
poured through in that phone conversation to him, like, it's going to be great. I, no matter how it seems to go, when you go before the judge, it's going to be great. I will guarantee you that. And the next day, after he had talked with her, he went before the judge, and the judge didn't throw the book at him. And on his way to meet the judge, he met this girl, and he was in so much joy and love after talking to his mother, that he just said, I am so happy. I'm going before the judge today, but I am just so happy. And I, I don't know what's going to happen. They may lock me up or whatever, but if I'm not locked up, will you go out on a date? I feel like I could marry you. <laughs> and the girl said, I feel it. And so he went off. The judge didn't throw the book at him. And then they, he had a, a nice relationship waiting for him <laughs> on top with, with whipped cream and a cherry. Uh, all, and, and my friend Suzanne, was, she, she was like, I can't believe all the things that happened. Then he, he had never spoken to, for years to the father. They started connecting. It was like a ripple effect of miracles happened just from her giving her son back to the Holy Spirit. It just rippled out in ways that she couldn't even fathom. It was spectacular. She still, when I go down to Australia, she still reminds me of that, that time when, when we sat down and had that heart-to-heart -heart talk about giving the Son over to the Holy Spirit, because it's had such a spectacular effect. So, so yeah, it is, there is a rinsing going on, and there will be miracle upon miracles as you allow yourself to be convinced that that you do have one responsibility, that you are giving your, your full attention and your mind's energy to that, and that everything will be handled in that. that the, the belief underneath it is, if I go for my enlightenment, my self-realization, and my happiness, that there's going to be some cost. There's going to be some people left behind to pay the price for my happiness. <laughs> My happiness will have to be paid for with their unhappiness. And what it is, is it's denying that everything's a reflection of mine. As you open to your joy and happiness, the whole world must reflect that happiness. Because there is no world apart from mine. It's all consciousness. It's not like there really are those out there suffering. If you believe in suffering, you can surely perceive it. And when you let your mind be cleaned of the misperception of suffering and the erroneous belief of suffering, then you see reflections of that love and you experience reflections of that love. You know, as you look outside, you've already looked inside. And, and whatever you found inside, you will find seemingly outside until that point where everything collapses and you go, Damn, there was never an inside and an outside. <laughs> there was only this unified awareness of connectivity, of love. You know, that's what it's been all along. Yes? Well, I've been, I, I have a situation with a, a, a family situation. I have a 13-year-old um, son living in England. And... Uh, I, I've been washing it out, um, not really understanding what it is that I'm washing, and that I hear all. You know, I hear the, I hear the root, the, um, and I suppose it's just the, the tears are just an expression of not understanding, and just be patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if any of you know the parable of all of my work with the messengers over the years, um, uh, I could just go down the road with the messengers with, with these kind of, what seem to be very practical kind of situations that are arising in awareness that, that seem to distract the mind from that stillness and peace. And yeah, and, and it's continuing on. Like right now, Jason's up in Canada making a trek across, but when he was up in Alberta and Edmonton, he had encounters um, with his brother, uh, with his mother, with his father. Very, very helpful. It's like a rinsing and a washing 
um, over and over and over and over that takes us into this experience. It, it takes lots of practice, lots of facing emotions when they come up, not stuffing them back down, not running from anything. Um, I know with Jason over the years, you know, he would talk about the, the conflicts of his family and the distortions and the deceptions and so on and so forth. And, and we'd be in this little peace house in Cincinnati and the phone would ring and oftentimes it was his mother Linda calling and, you know, to talk to Jason and so forth. And sometimes he was there, sometimes not. Um, but I always had these wonderful encounters, you know, even though I don't believe in the concepts anymore of father, mother, sister, brother, you know, children, adults, and all those different concepts. It's when you're just fully present, you just have these wonderful holy encounters with everyone without exception. So I would answer the phone and, and I answered the phone one time and it was Linda. Uh, Jason's mother, and she, we talked, she said, you know, I love him very much, but I'm very concerned for him, and I say, well, tell me about it, and she would just pour out all of her concerns and cares, and so on and so forth, and, and I would just listen and listen, and other people would answer the phone too, and sometimes tell me, oh, Linda called, she was drunk, and da 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 I always had wonderful, loving, coherent, uh, conversations with her every time I answered the phone. Uh, I never found anything else, but one time I was talking with her and she just poured her heart so fully out of everything she was feeling and then there was this nice peaceful quiet. And she said to me, do you know who you are? And I said, hmm, what do you think? And she said, you are an expression of the Most High. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's good. That, that about sums it up. That's really good. And, and it was really cool because, because we simply perceive what we believe. And when we allow the beliefs to be washed from our mind, we draw forth witnesses to our state of mind. It's just the way that it works. The world doesn't operate apart from consciousness, or apart from our mind. It's there just to follow the orders of the mind, you know. It's there under the direction of the mind. And so that's a common thing for me where people will say about, oh, do you know, so and so, and so and so and so and so. It's like, you know, if you keep your mind pristine and clean and aligned, then, then you perceive a world that reflects that pristine mind. That's what the happy dream is about. That's why it's called a happy dream. It's not just called a happy dream like hopefully happy. <laughs> Jesus says, when you train your mind, you will reach a state that's hopefully happy. He never uses the hopefully word. He calls it the happy dream. Because it's happy. And it's joyful. And it's, it's, he even calls it the real world. After he spends a whole book telling you the world's not real. He starts talking about the real world. <laughs> but he's talking about the happy dream. You know, it's as close to reality as you get. So, for me, that's a very important principle to keep in mind, that when I'm going through this, you know, I just need to keep getting washed and cleansed. And, and it's fun. I enjoy the interactions I've had. I've had lots of visits to New Zealand, you know, and to meet uh, Roger. You know, and Jackie, and some of you have met Jackie because she's quite involved with us. Jackie Simpson, she was here this summer, and um, her house just sold in um, uh, New Zealand now. So she's another step, another symbol of being untethered. She is loose now in the universe to go <laughs> shine her light, and she had to be very patient with that. And so. Just down the line, you know, we have, if, when we talk about our experiences of going through this awakening process, parents, children, locations, geographical locations, friendships, uh, all those kind of things are coming up into awareness and often have very strong emotional attachments to them. 
and you just work the process. You know, you, you do the forgiveness work, and eventually it just loosens and loosens, and you're lifted up towards that one responsibility. I'm seeing the same things in my parents as my children, and it's like I've always loved my mum and dad, and it's, it, it was more like a respectful love, I guess. And over the last couple of years, I've really felt like I love my parents now. And it doesn't seem to be because they're my parents. It just feels like I can love them. And I'm really starting to feel that it's sort of like I can really feel like I love my kids now. And not as my kids, but I, I just really feel like this overwhelming love. And as you've been talking, I, I feel like... As I've been stepping deeper and deeper into my calling, I feel like I'm falling in love. Mm -hmm. And now the ego can use that and say that I just have all this special love with them and that's going to keep me really trapped in everything. Or I can just keep falling in love with them as well and not let that hold me back and see that there's nothing wrong with that. But I just have to look at where, I, where I'm where i just trying to get something back from that, rather than just being able to fall in love with that. And it's sort of like, it's like a distraction in my mind, you know, like it can be distractive, but if I put my thoughts on what they're doing or how I can be helpful rather than just feel the love. So it's like somehow wanting to avoid love in some ways because I think it means something. I don't know. It just seems like I just need to just let everything just be and allow any kind of love really and um, just not try to hang on to it. Does that make sense? Oh, exactly. It, it's like, the ego will try to, you know, once you start working with the Course, and then this word comes up, special, then the ego will be happy to point out <laughs> where you have special relationships, and how you're, you're stuck. It will like, use the metaphysics to go, oh yeah, see, you're not there, and here's why. And it points it out very closely, and, and it's like, see, guilt, guilt, guilt. You're guilty, and I was right. And what this is more of a sense of, the Holy Spirit knows that you have to, you start with these deep feelings and love and connection that's in there, and you just open up the parameters to include the rest of the six and a half billion people on the planet. It's almost like here we are in the Wild West, you know, in the West they have, you know, ranchers and whatever, and ranchers carry their rope because they carry their lasso. And the lasso is supposed to rope the calf and whatever, but you can always, it's, it's got a knot on, you can always keep expanding. So you can just say, well, you go, no, no, I don't, I'm not going to buy it that I'm guilty because of these special relationships. I just keep opening my lasso wider and wider and wider. I'm going to rope the whole universe in with this, with this rope. And you see, that's all in inclusion. So that's what I always got. It wasn't like, I was like, oh, now I've got to let go of my mother and my sister and my father. It was more like, now I'm just opening to include everyone else into that love, to make it all inclusive. Special would only mean drawing borders and lines and saying, I love here, 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 but not there, there, there. It, you know, it's always that dividing line. Even with the idea of spiritual community, I've always said, you know, really spiritual community is just the state of mind because as long as it involves borders and persons and so on and so forth, then there's who's in and who's out. And I'm just tired of that game, who's in and who's out, with anything, with with family, with country, with spiritual community, with Course in Miracles. I used to have a friend that would write to me and he would, he would say, David, what are we going to do with our fragmented Course in Miracles community? This is the kind of emails I would get. And I would write back, 
I would say, where does that community begin and where does it end? And why do you feel it's fragmented? And he'd say, well, it's obvious we're arguing and this and that. And, and he would try to draw it around A Course in Miracles and to me I thought, oh, that's way too small. You know, I'm not, I don't even like the idea of Course in Miracles community. I know what people mean when they talk about it, but, but for me, why should we have a community in form or a community with boundaries? You know, where there's some that are in and some that are out. And, you know, we could, it's fine to let the Holy Spirit use the symbols in kind of a very inspiring way, but let's not draw lines and borders. So really, in one sense, you're just, you do feel that love with your children, you feel that love with your parents, and you're just opening now to everything. Even what you brought up the other day about partnership, you know, if the Holy Spirit wants to use the symbol of partnership in your life, you know, who, who are you to call it special? You know, if it's being used to, to flush up expectations, to clear the mind out, then it's being used in a helpful way. And again, it's the Holy Spirit using what the ego made in hate to free the mind. And that's a beautiful thing. It's something that you can go with and celebrate. And that's the same with your children and parents. Yeah, the more that you just give it over to falling in love with everyone, you feel more like not located. You know, you get you get more and more of these expansive experiences where you just don't feel those definitions of being like locked in, located, you know, trapped. You know, it's just the, it goes from your mind. You feel expansive. And, and it's great with the Course, you know, when he talks about whenever you meet anyone, remember it's a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. It's just beautiful ways over and over in the Course that are basically saying, it's just one of us here. It's just one of us. It's just one of us. As we perceive, as we treat, as we think of, we are still experiencing ourself. And when we think of ourselves in egoic terms, then we perceive a fragmented world of separation. When we give that over to the Holy Spirit and say, Yeah, I don't, that doesn't work anymore. It's just not working. I give it back then we get these kind of glorified, beautiful experiences of, of connection and oneness. And it's like, yeah, that feels natural. Ah, that's we're back to that. Ah, beautiful. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about um, yesterday during the movie when you talked, you touched on that idea. Um, Fearful, I'm just not quite sure. <clears throat> You're talking around the idea of um, like seeing uh, even the future as like it's, it's kind of the whole thing's over, and there's a way of joining with spirit to like almost. Um, I think I heard you say like visualize, you know, if you're kind of not sure about what direction I'll go this way or I'll be with this person or just kind of almost see yourself, you know, walking through that and is that, is that the direction I'd be going or, and I kind of felt really excited, I thought, yeah, that's, that feels really simple and, you know, like, I was, I was with that for a while and then, I, then suddenly all these doubts, it's like, how, how would I, like, like, it feels like just not trusting myself or something to, um, yeah, to trust that, it's like, hang on, would that be spirit or is that, just ego, you know, wanting something a certain way, or my own agenda, or, um, and I also felt myself going, God, if I could really get adept at doing that, I was just thinking, man, I, I feel I'd misuse it to sort of like, get lotto, you know, winning, win the lottery and all this sort of, you know, stuff like, so, I don't know, like, I guess I just wanted to spit that out, and maybe, uh, if, um, if you could, um, if you could, um, yeah, maybe expand a little bit on that and even just talk a little bit around, um, I don't know, just, just, um, where, yeah, just where you can sort of be more 
sure that it is spirit that you're kind of lining up with and not just kind of some little you know agenda that's got nothing to do with spirit yeah that's what i wanted to ask you Thanks. yeah yeah we there jesus dictated to helen a course of miracles and then he also gave a, a pamphlet called the, the song of prayer and then he gave a pamphlet called psychotherapy purpose process and practice and the song of prayer is fascinating because it takes you right into that topic of prayer. So, so he describes prayer as like a ladder that's rising up, and and the lower forms of prayer, which he's also saying you can't possibly pray from a from a state of mind or a level that's beyond where you're at. So it's like he's describing the ladder. It's like it's this beautiful ladder, and you just wherever you are on the ladder, wherever you are in terms of your prayer life. It's perfect because you can't possibly pray for what's beyond what you can uh, comprehend. And so, basically, prayer is is equated with desire. So it's like prayer and desire are synonymous. So when you are, we'll say, more at the bottom of the ladder, and you go, "I want a burger," that's your prayer. I want a burger. That's a prayer. You, you want something, and you want something that you believe you don't have, <laughs> you know, which is a, of course a belief, and, and there's a desire for it. And then when you move on up, you can move up the ladder. Uh, he talks a little bit about praying for one's enemies, like, you know, what is praying for one's enemies all about? And he says, oh, if you have enemies, you have great need for prayer indeed. <laughs> well, you see how he's just turning it around. Like if you if you have enemies, then of course you need to pluck those grievances and those attack thoughts from your mind. You, that's the, what prayer is for: is to free your mind of the grievances and the attack thoughts. And then you can even move a little higher up the ladder, and you can pray for things, or you could pray for uh, attributes and abilities, like. Praying for peace, or praying, Lord, give me patience, you know, or Lord, build my trust. You know, it can be, or get away from specifics and things where you're kind of praying for characteristics or attributes that seem to be uh, aligned with God and holiness. And then, you know, you, you approach the top of the ladder, and when you get to the top of the ladder, he describes that is your prayer of the heart becomes just this, Father, what is your will for me? Okay, that's the top of the ladder. In fact, it, once you can get to that point, and that is your prayer, your authentic prayer, it's given immediately, of course. It's not like God's going to be like, okay, <laughs> hold on there. <laughs> You're asking a pretty high prayer there, you know, this and this. But when you can get to the point where your mind is so emptied, of desire, desires of the world, desire for things, desires for manifesting anything, having things being a certain way, desire for a certain picture to be just the way that you think you want it, even though it's just based on your past preferences, <laughs> that that's what's wanting it to be that way. When you can get to, Father, what is your will for me, then that's, that's the top of the ladder. And then, then the ladder disappears. You don't get back to heaven and tell your war stories. <laughs> like, remember when I killed you, and then you killed me back, and all this and this, you know, it's like, it's not like a, a support group, you know, where everyone goes around and says, uh, how did you get to God? Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> you think your love, your road was extreme. <laughs> <laughs> sit down, even though there's no seats here in heaven, but sit down and listen to my story. Uh, you know, that's all gone. It's just bliss. It's just pure abstract oneness is, is what heaven is. So, when, I think a lot of people, as they're moving up the ladder, they can get to a point where they, they realize that they don't want to get caught up in the manifesting phase with prayer. Like, they, they do realize that there's like a danger to thinking that you can use the power of your mind to get whatever you think you want, or even to start to use the power of prayer, the power of mind, to pray for specific outcomes. You know, 
uh, or specific things. You know, sometimes people used to tell me all this stuff about Sai Baba manifesting jewelry and rings and over in India, you know, you just manifest, you know, this jewelry and this stuff right out of thin air, you know, and different stories of, of that happening in, in different parts, not that he didn't even have to be present, but he could manifest for you <laughs> a bracelet or something and this and that. But once you start to realize that as long as you have something specific in mind that you're praying for, <laughs> like lunch for example, <laughs> as long as you have something specific that you're praying for, you're simply asking for the past to be repeated in some way that the ego prefers. That's all that's happening. Every time you desire or pray for specifics, you're asking for something from the past to be repeated in some way that the ego desires is best. Implying that you know <laughs> what is best. And what else is higher than that? Father, what is your will for me? There is no request for specifics in that. You're asking for a state of mind. You're asking for pure love, unconditional love. You're asking for pure joy. And it's, it's lifted up. It's, the mind is freed from its desire for specifics based on, on time. That's quantum. Okay, the, one, the last question after the bell. <laughs> Um, thy will be done. Yesterday you mentioned, um, because basically the Father's will, is that the same as mine? I mean, that's what, although it's not the ego's will, right? Because yes. it says, thy will be done is, is much better than my will be done. <laughs> but yeah. yesterday you mentioned something about thy will be done, which is not quite correct either. Well, in the end, uh, thy will be done and my will be done is, is the same. Uh, because God's will for me is perfect happiness, Christ's will for me, which is my will for myself as the Christ, is for perfect happiness, and it's all in alignment. So, I would say that that, that prayer, like a lot of the mystics and saints really work with that prayer of not my will but thy will be done, it's still coming from, of course, from the ego, and there's a strong identification <laughs> still with the ego, but it is saying, let let your will uh, be become my awareness. You know, it's like a prayer for let me let go of this personal, uh, unique, separate will, and and merge in the glory of your will. That's really what the intention of the old prayer was. And then you get Jesus comes along and and. He's saying, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me, and, and if you've seen me, you know, he's implying, I and the Father are one. He wasn't saying that he was God, he was just saying, we all have one unified spirit, and, and I'm, I am that spirit, <laughs> which is the end of, you know, not my will, but thy will be done. <laughs>